So yesterday was asked a question, which I think is worthy of a video response because it's a question that I hear often, not particularly addressed, I feel, honestly, I feel, and it's a question around grappling skills, jiu-jitsu, when it comes to someone who is a much smaller frame person versus a much larger, stronger, dominant, powerful person. Does jiu-jitsu actually give you an advantage, as is typically purported, versus a much bigger, stronger opponent, especially if you are smaller framed versus that person. Because the general kind of rhetoric that gets thrown around is jiu-jitsu is the ultimate equalizer. Size and strength don't, doesn't matter if you have jiu-jitsu. It's all about technique and leverage and how true is that? The simple answer is, there is no simple answer, I think. It's also a delicate subject because it's kind of one of those landmine questions, right? You can step into something very, very quickly. People get really offended, especially in the jiu-jitsu community. And then you, in this kind of battle between just being, you know, trying to prove your point, right? So trying to say this without offending people is quite difficult is what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> but okay, here's the thing, right? So first things first. I've been doing jiu-jitsu almost close on three decades now. I've had a love-hate relationship with jiu-jitsu. Initially, I really started doing it because I recognized that it was a part of the fight game that I didn't have and my focus was on self-preservation and realizing that I realized that I needed to get it down. To be honest, for the longest time, I really never enjoyed jiu-jitsu because I was a stand-up guy. I did it because I knew I had to do it and it wasn't my kind of first love. I mean, still, even today, the thing that I'm known for is my stand-up game. And that's the thing that's always been my go-to, right? It's the thing that I loved. But I recognized that jiu-jitsu was an important part of the game. And that's one of the reasons why I delved into it. And, you know, over the years, I've come to love jiu-jitsu. So don't get me wrong. I mean, it's a lot of fun. Of course, it has huge application to self-preservation. And it's an absolute necessary skill. With that said, when somebody is asking me who is 50 kilograms and they're doing jiu-jitsu, and they're asking me, well, how effective is this actually going to be against somebody that's 120 kilograms, right? Somebody that's much bigger than me, huge, a monster, who's extremely strong. I have to be honest and say, look, it's going to be extremely difficult. And of course, there's some things that may be in your favor. A person might be very big and strong, but have no understanding of the fight game and have no understanding of jujitsu. Of course, then you have an advantage, right? Second to that, Absolutely, you can't just go in with, quote unquote, the standard approach of jiu-jitsu, right? If you are much smaller versus a much bigger opponent, you're going to have to change and adapt your game. Your game's going to have to change completely. And the reality is, is that the kind of game that you're going to be required to play then is going to be considerably different to the game that we would traditionally see, right? We're Two people get on the mat, you know, slap bump, start rolling, get into each other. That's not something you'd want to do if you were a smaller opponent versus a much bigger opponent. There is a complete change of mindset and approach and techniques that would need to come into play. Knowing that does put you in a much better advantage because you would know what to avoid and what would be your go-to in dealing with a much bigger opponent. With all of that said, the reality is, I think there is some disingenuous conversations in the jiu-jitsu community where they do push this constant narrative and it makes sense, right? If you are only a grappling instructor, if you're only a jiu-jitsu black belt, that's all you do. You're not going to come out and say, hold on a second, you know, there's some things that don't work so well um, when we're talking a purely jiu-jitsu perspective that we may want to consider because you're selling that service, you're selling that product. Why would you come and say that your product has some defects in it that, that you may need to consider? Of course, nobody's going to do that, right? And so I think, unfortunately, a lot of 
the jiu-jitsu community just go with the standard narrative. You know, that size and strength don't make a difference, leverage is all that's important and good technique. But the truth is, that's not actually correct. Even if somebody at 50 kilograms had a very solid understanding of jiu-jitsu, they meet somebody who's this 120 kilogram Samoan, right? Who is just powerful and has a huge amount of strength, gifted, right? Strong guy. And I'm obviously, you know, over-exaggerating because they wouldn't even have to be that, to be quite honest, to be a problem. That person's going to be a problem. You know, no amount of understanding of leverage and so forth is going to necessarily enable you to deal with that person because that person is just huge. A lot of black belts, if they were really honest, would tell you that too, right? If you're a smaller black belt and you're going up against somebody on the mat who doesn't have the skill level that you have, but they're much bigger than you and much stronger than you, they're a nightmare. They're difficult to deal with. It's one of the kind of contentious issues I've always had with jiu-jitsu. Because on the one side, I've always wanted to try and believe that narrative, oh, that size, strength, and so forth doesn't make any difference. But every time I've got on the mat and I've had to deal with somebody much bigger, much stronger than me, and they don't necessarily have the understanding of jiu-jitsu that I have, they might be like a white belt or something like that, they are a pain in the ass to deal with, right? Just because of how strong and how big they actually are. I mean, there've been times when I haven't been able to put my legs around somebody in a guard, I close the guard. Can you imagine that? Now, how is somebody who's 50 kilograms going to do that? Or I've been in situations where I've set up everything 100% perfect, got into that perfect armbar position and try to armbar this person and they just kind of just sat there and looked at me and then literally just stood up, picked up, picked me up and dropped me on the floor. Now, I would consider that I have a pretty high level of skill if we're talking about the technique. I mean, I understand the technique, I understand how to do it, right? And in those instances, comes back to what I said earlier, I had to change the way that I approached my jiu-jitsu in that moment. I had to change the game plan. I had to approach it completely different, not the kind of standard kind of approach I would normally take, right? And then it was about keeping distance, about not allowing that person to get controls on me, about working as much as I possibly could to their back, get into the position where I could choke them out. And even then, right? I mean, just putting your hooks in on a huge, massive monster and trying to go for a figure four choke is a whole lot easier said than done, right? So that's why I would now I default to more cloth chokes because that's more effective against a much bigger opponent. But with all of that said, where this question was asked, you know, of me yesterday, you know, and I said, sure, we can change the game. I can show you how to deal with a much bigger opponent. That's going to be obviously an ace, you know, in your pocket. However, to be brutally honest, if you are outsized by somebody by that much, and you know that that's going to be a problem, avoid the ground at all costs. Avoid going there. Don't let the situation go to the ground. Don't have this idea of saying, well, this person is this freaking huge monster coming at me, I'm just going to drop to my ass and try to play God on this person, you're going to get killed, even if you know what you're supposed to be doing, because size and strength make a difference, generally almost everywhere, and especially if this person has athleticism. The easier way to kind of get the sense of this is, and to kind of maybe bolster my argument is, okay, if jiu-jitsu is all about leverage, it's all about technique and size and strength don't really matter because you're using the person's size and strength against them and so forth. Why do you have weight divisions in competition? I mean, that's an easy question. Why do you have them? Because then it should just be an open division and everybody should be able to compete against everybody. But the reason you have weight divisions in competition because size and strength make a difference, right? Another thing to consider here is that another question I was asked was like, well, okay, we learn all these takedowns. How am I going to, at 50 kilograms, take down somebody who's basically more than double the size of me? And, and I'm, I'm using the extreme, right? I'm saying like double the size, but let's be honest. I mean, if you know anything about groundwork, you know that somebody who has even a 15 kilogram advantage on you is, is a huge thing, right? You, can, you know it straight away. It changes everything, right? Compared to somebody who's at your size. And I think, again, 
you know, uh, just not to go down the rabbit hole, but a lot of times when people are talking this way is because they're talking from a competitive place, right? They oftentimes are working against people that their same size. And so that's their kind of their reference point. Um, but if they're really honest and they reflect on the times that they, they were actually rolling against guys who are bigger and stronger, then they know that things are a whole lot more difficult. So coming back to this question about takedowns, right? I have to be completely honest. My answer to the person was, was this. Okay, look, if you really feel you need to take this person down, I'm going to say that you're going to have to somehow disrupt them with some kind of strike and then potentially go for the takedown. So I wouldn't directly go for a takedown if I was much smaller against a much bigger opponent. I would do something to disrupt their entire system. Now, that could be a knee to the leg, a, a kick to the groin, a, a strike to the throat, a slap to the ear, one of those things, right? And when the person is basically got nailed and they're trying to recover from that in that moment of their loss of focus, a takedown is evident. And that comes to my final point. And this is where I see a huge problem is that in a lot of ways, what's happened is at a time when jujitsu was really focused on self-preservation, it has slowly over time shifted more and more and more to the point of now just being a sport, a competitive base. And that also changes a lot of things because there are a lot of things that you would do if you're thinking self-preservation as far as grappling and jujitsu that now is never considered in the sport or wouldn't get you points, for example, right? You wouldn't be able to win a match that way, but would be very effective if we think about self-preservation. That's a huge problem. Because within that is also something that's been completely taken out, especially if we're talking strictly jiu-jitsu here and not people that cross-train. But historically speaking, jiu-jitsu had strikes in it. And that is important because not only do you want to know how to defend against those strikes, as an example, or weapons, you also want to be able to apply them yourself. And so that's key. And in actual fact, you know, a lot of times, again, not just for a smaller opponent, but just anybody generally, it's going to be so much easier actually for me to apply my jiu-jitsu skills if I can utilize strikes as well. Okay, let me give you a simple example. If I mount somebody and they kind of close up and they're really strong and they've got good positioning with their hands, right? They've got good framing. It can be quite difficult to leverage that out and set yourself up for an armbar. However, one solid punch to that person's face and I've got the armbar, right? So again, this is one of the reasons why my personal kind of approach to jiu-jitsu is I'm focused first and foremost and primarily on self-preservation. Now, I'd be considered old school, I guess, amongst the new school jiu-jitsu guys, which is fine, right? Because I'm not doing it for competition. I'm doing it for self-preservation. That's where my key is. And so I feel like when you focused on the self-preservation aspect, you get a more realistic view of jiu-jitsu, both its strengths and its weaknesses. And it has great strengths and there are weaknesses and we need to know what those weaknesses are. But then at the same time, allows you to learn how you can navigate or manage those weaknesses, and that's really what my approach is to jiu-jitsu. That's why I teach street jits, because I think it's really important, right? Do I love the role? Of course, the role is great, it's fun, right? And there's things that you get in the role that are gonna be super helpful to your street jits game. There are certain things when you're just drilling, you know, drilling techniques that you can't get by drilling. Things like timing, distancing, the ability to remain calm under pressure. All of these things come from the role. That's where the role is super important. But then you need to know what needs to change and what you need to adapt when you move into self-preservation. This is no different to my philosophy when I talk about the Crazy Monkey Striking Program. Now, I use a combat athletic base. We do sparring, exactly like in Jiu-Jitsu. Sparring allows students to develop things like timing, distancing, being calm, and so forth. That's where you're going to develop it, right? But to think that you can just take a combat athletic base, quote-unquote what's typically referred to as sport, and say that in of itself is enough to transfer over into self-preservation is an incorrect way of looking at it because you cannot just do it like that. You can't just, for example, I came from a boxing background. That's one of the things I did for quite a long time, 
I, you know, I worked through the ranks, I got to golden gloves, I did all of those things. However, once I was actually working the door at, you know, outside some of the toughest, roughest nightclubs in Johannesburg, I learned very, very quickly about what works really well, boxing wise, right, in a sport environment, and what's not going to be effective if you want to apply that ex exact same game over to the street. It required that I made the changes that were necessary in order to make it more geared towards self-preservation. And that was the genesis for the Crazy Monkey Defense program. That's why I keep saying over and over, it is fantastic that Crazy Monkey Defense is used in combat sports. It's awesome to see that. However, that is not what it was developed and designed for. It was designed for street application, for self-preservation. Of course, then, if you try to just, for example, do it the other way around, take the crazy monkey defense system and you want to place it purely into a combat sports base, let's say, for example, something like boxing, there are things there that are not going to be allowed. You're not going to be allowed to pick your elbows up and spike people's hands as they're coming in towards you, right? Running their hands into your elbows. You're going to be penalized for that. So what ends up happening is you have to change just in the same way the other way around. You have to take what we have in Crazy Monkey Defense and you're going to have to change certain things to make it palatable for a combat sport environment, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But the reverse is also true. You cannot just take a combat sport environment and move it over to self-preservation and say, in of itself, that's enough. You need to make adaptations. You need to know what to change in order to make it effective for a self-preservation environment. The most obvious example and what needs to be changed is that in boxing, I'm dealing with one opponent in a controlled environment with rules. In the street, not a controlled environment, no rules, and likely multiple attackers, and there may be weapons involved, as an example, right? So now you need to know what to change. Of course, there are many things that will cross over from combat sports to street, but there are a lot of things that won't, and so you need to know that. So coming back to jiu-jitsu, because this is the discussion, same thing again. There are many things that a student would do in the role, right, just playing around on the, on the mat and working through what we typically see as a traditional approach to doing jiu-jitsu, where we're rolling with an opponent, which they would do. However, if they now wanted to take that game and move it over to self-preservation, it's not just going to move over exactly. You're going to have to make adaptations. You're going to have to change things. And one of those things you're going to have to be cognizant of is that size and strength make a difference. And so that if you are a smaller frame person moving into a self-preservation realm where there is somebody that you're dealing with that is much bigger, much stronger, and so forth than you, you're going to have to know what to change. I hope that made sense and I didn't ramble on too much. But anyway, one thing that is coming up in June, I'm going to be doing a seminar down in Brighton in the United Kingdom. And I'm going to be focusing one of those days on the Sunday. The information on all of this is going to come out soon. But that Sunday session is going to be about a smaller versus a larger opponent in a grappling environment. And what are the strategies and tactics that you should be deploying which are going to be much better strategies and tactics if you want to move over to self-preservation. The session before that on the Saturday is going to be a session about street jits. And so if you happen to be in the area somewhere around where you can get to us in Brighton, I recommend you come down because it'll be fun and it'll be an awesome experience for you. And on the Saturday session, you don't need to know anything about groundwork. So if you're coming from a self-preservation background, you're training in different systems, whatever that system is, but you want to get a realistic, hard-hitting, no bullshit um, experience of what grappling is for the street, that session is going to set you up with some really cool skill sets that you will be able to put into your game and definitely see a completely different approach to how modern grappling or modern jiu-jitsu is often taught.